For the majority of women, childbirth is a natural life event and not a medical condition, though most women will have a health professional present during their labour. There lies a conundrum. Research reveals that childbirth is safer the less it is interfered with. Making choices about childbirth beforehand and during the labour can be a daunting prospect. This video does not replace medical advice. It is here to help you navigate through the process of decision making in an unfamiliar environment. In my hometown of New Plymouth in New Zealand, we have the famous Len Lai Centre. It's a wonderful example of the development of engineering over the decades to where it could now be built. There have also been medical advancements in surgical techniques and the use of anaesthetics to where caesareans now are safer than they have ever been and they are saving some lives of women and babies when it is medically indicated. However, there is no evidence to support planning a caesarean section when it is not medically indicated. Parents untrained in things medical can often find themselves in a vulnerable position having to participate in decision making in an unfamiliar environment. During a normal full term labour, medical professionals are present to monitor the normal process. They'll be checking the mother's blood pressure and monitoring the baby's heartbeat. And if they detect any abnormalities, they will then discuss it with you. In my video on the labour process, I said I would discuss with you in this video the medical methods of pain relief available. There are three main ones, gas, pethidine and epidural. Gas is a mixture of nitrous oxide and oxygen, known as entonox. It is breathed in using a mouthpiece or a mask controlled by the mother. She only uses it as she has a contraction. It takes a few breaths to take effect and then once she's finished having the contraction, it wears off to where she picks it up again once the next contraction comes. It can be tiring to use for a long time and so it suits later labour. The drug does pass through the placenta to the baby. However, there doesn't seem to be any short-term adverse effects. Gas has a limited effect on the pain experience for women and may make them feel nauseated or a bit dizzy. However, it can be helpful in helping regulate the breathing. Pethidine is administered intramuscularly with an injection and it usually has a side effect of nausea as well and an anti-nausea injection is often given at the same time. It takes around 20 minutes to take effect and lasts two to four hours. It does pass through the placenta to the baby and it may affect the baby's heart rate. It also takes three to six days after the baby's born for the baby to eliminate it from its system. The baby may have decreased alertness when it's born and difficulties initiating breastfeeding. It does provide some pain relief, but a substantial number of women still experience a lot of pain. Then there's the epidural. It may not be available in your hospital because it does require an anaesthetist to administer. A lot of women do find it difficult to sit still while it is being set up because they are often experiencing difficult contractions at the same time. However, for most women, 
there is a complete elimination of pain. There can be more use of instrumental deliveries as the mother experiences numbness and finds it difficult to fully participate in pushing. It also has a blood pressure lowering effect and it can interfere with the initiation of breastfeeding. Those are the three main medical methods of pain relief. Research has found that most women underestimate, particularly first timers, how much pain they're going to experience with the contractions. So it's helpful to have a broad knowledge of the non-evasive methods of pain relief as well. The ones that I talked about in my labour video about using water. It has been found that about two hours in a pool or a bath is the maximum for optimal pain relief. Otherwise you might find the labour gets a bit prolonged. It's also about being in an upright position and using breathing nice and calm and relaxed to make sure the environment is conducive to the production of oxytocin. For most women, it's an assumption that she's going to have her baby in hospital. However, in some places, there is a choice and some women do choose to have their baby born at home. I chose to have a home birth. I was comfortable, I was relaxed, I was in my own environment and the midwives were guests in my home. I found that after having the baby as well, I could sleep so much better in, in my own home. It's such a, a natural process that our bodies are designed to go through that um, it just seemed right to be at home. Regardless of the chosen birthplace, there will be a decision made at some point of when you engage with the midwife either for you to go to the hospital or for the midwife to come to your home. The decision is often made depending on the distance that you are from the hospital or the midwife is from your home and whether it's rush hour traffic or not. How is your labour progressing? Has it been going for a while? Are the contractions getting stronger? Are they coming in a lovely rhythmic pattern? The contractions may be lasting 30 to 60 seconds and the gap between the contractions can be getting smaller to where they may be only 5 or 4 minutes apart. That means your labour is progressing well and you might want to contact the midwife. Once the midwife has arrived at your home or you at the hospital and you're all settled in, you might be asked if the midwife could give you a vaginal examination. It's also known as a VE. There are two schools of thought on vaginal examinations. One is that it's just simply a form of monitoring and another where it is considered an invasive procedure. Regardless to what camp that you're in, Vaginal examinations do require your consent. They will determine how far dilated you are and how soft the cervix is. Just for that moment, it is not a good indicator of when you will actually give birth because there are so many variables that come into play during the labour process. So there's no evidence to support or reject the use of routine vaginal examinations. If you agree to have a vaginal examination, you may be in an upright and comfortable position and then you'll have to go down onto your back usually. This might feel a little bit awkward and uncomfortable. So as soon as the vaginal examination is over, you can get right back up where you were before and you might need someone to help and support you to do that and that will help the labour to continue progressing. There are lots of decisions to be made during the labour process and you might be asked to make a decision about something that you know nothing about. The International Childbirth Education Association 
has come up with an acronym BRAIN to help you ask the questions of the medical professionals so that you can have the information you need to make confident decisions. I'm going to take you through one very common medical intervention using the BRAIN acronym so you can see how it works in practice. I'm going to talk to you about the artificial rupture of the membranes. It's where the midwife or the doctor breaks your waters. It's also known as ARM or amniotomy. Quite a number of women go into labour without their waters breaking and after the first vaginal examination it's discovered the membranes are still intact and the midwife might ask you, shall I break your waters? Your first thought might be, oh no, is there something wrong? Be reassured that an intact bag of waters is a positive thing. Each birth has its own timing of when the waters are broken. The first things you can ask to determine how quick you have to make a decision is, is this an emergency? And they might reply, oh no, you've got plenty of time, you don't have to make the decision right away. You need to find out what the procedure is and how it's done and you need it to be told to you in language you can understand and feel free to ask questions for clarification. To break the bag of waters, a long crochet hook type instrument is used. It's put into your vagina and it nicks the membranes and then the water comes out. It can either be a gush or a trickle. It depends on how far the baby's head is down and how much it is acting like a plug. Once you've established that there is no emergency and you understand what the procedure is, you can go through the BRAIN acronym and ask questions to get the information you need to make informed decisions. B is for benefits. What are the benefits for the mother and the baby? There hasn't been shown to be any benefits. Once it used to be said that it would speed up the labour, but the Cochrane Review has shown that there's no evidence to support the breaking of waters in a full term, normal labour, even if it is prolonged. Cochrane Reviews provide highly trusted evidence. They're easily found. You just need to write in Cochrane in the Google search engine and up will come some links. You just click on them, go into the review page and write in amniotomy into the search and up will come some titles. You click on the one you want to read. The summaries are easily found and easily understood. The findings can provide further information for discussion. R. What are the risks to the mother and the baby? Once the membranes have gone, the water that was supporting the cord has gone and it may mean the baby's heart rate might drop off. The baby is now vulnerable to infections. Women also find that they might experience more difficult contractions as the cushion that was there between the baby's head and the cervix has gone and the baby's head is bearing down suddenly harder onto the cervix. A. Alternatives. What else could you do to bring about the desired effect? Is it that your labour is a bit prolonged? Maybe you need to do something to increase your oxytocin levels to keep the labour progressing. So when I was doing some childbirth classes, I'd heard a little bit about oxytocin. And um, yeah, so I thought, well, you know, maybe a cuddle from my husband will release some oxytocin and keep things going. So I'd been in labour from the night before and my contractions during the day had been between three and five minutes apart. 
and I was just there thinking, is this just going to go on all day? You know, I can't do this all day. It was getting, you know, the contractions were getting more intense and more intense. And so I decided I'd have another bath. So I ran the bath and had a bath and then, um, yeah, got out of the bath and lay down on the bed and then asked my husband to give me a cuddle. And then all of a sudden my waters broke and there was this gush, gush, gush of my waters all over the bed. So after that, the contractions went from five minutes apart to almost no minutes apart and it was a mad panic. Ring the midwife, ring my mum, ring my mother-in-law. Yeah, so my waters broke and then after my waters broke, it was about just over four hours before Gemma was born. I, intuition. What do you think about it? Had you been hoping that you would have a natural labour? And now that you've been confronted with having to make the decision, you still feel as though you haven't been given any convincing evidence to support you to change your mind. Breaking the waters can be likened a little bit to losing your virginity. Once you've lost it, you can't get it back. The same can be said for the breaking of the waters. You can't push that water back in and close up that bag. In. Need time. You might like to ask the medical professional to give you some time to think about it. Or you might like them to come back in another couple of hours and reassess the situation. Or I like to also use the letter N to ask the question, what would happen if we did nothing? These questions are usually not easily asked before you're in labour because you never know how the labour is going to progress and what interventions you might be asked to give consent to. Using these questions during labour when you're confronted with interventions will mean you'll feel more confident about the decisions you have made and you'll be more positive about the outcome. Before I finish, I'd like to talk to you about something known as the cascade of interventions. It's about what can happen in labour when you agree to the first intervention. It may cause a ripple effect, where you require another intervention, then another, and the labour just doesn't go how you imagined it would, and you feel you haven't had control. So that very first intervention, consider it carefully. You may be asked to have your labour induced. Ask the questions from the acronym BRAIN. Go to the Cochrane Review site and read up on it. Then you can give your informed consent or not and feel comfortable with the decision that you have made. This will lay the foundation for further decisions you may have to make during the labour process and on into the journey of parenthood. Happy parenting!